most of what we call Christianity, I, I think it's just part of our nature that we, we, we still seem to think as we go about our daily lives that if I am doing something good and I'm following God in something in my life and I'm being obedient to Him, then obviously He's going to bless me for that. And uh, and I and I won't have no worries. And I can tell you that there has been times that on my worst days, God blessed me more than on days where I really strove to serve Him and to do right. And uh, I'm not saying, like, you know, what Paul said, shall we uh, sin, therefore, that grace may abound? God forbid. But I'm telling you, when, when God chooses to bless people, um, in many cases in the Bible, you'll see that the condition of their life is not what it should be. And I'll just run down, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I'll just run down some, some situations for you. When, when, God, when, when God was there with the two angels visiting uh, Ab Abraham and Sarah, and a God began to talk about the Lord, it was Christ, began to talk about how Sarah was going to have a child, uh, she was in the tent and she laughed in there. She laughed in the tent when she heard God say that. And because um, she didn't believe it. And, when God, and God called her out on it. And she lied to God. And said, I didn't laugh. And he said, yeah, you did laugh. And, that, you know, and, and I, I would ask you, what was her spiritual condition? When... The Lord said to her, this time next year, you're going to be holding a baby. She was, she was denying it. She was mocking God. She was being disobedient to God. She was being dishonest with God. And yet God still blessed her. When God decides to bless people, he blesses them. And nothing holds him back. Uh, he said, he said in his word, I will have mercy on them. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will pardon who I, who I pardon. Um, what was the spiritual condition of Samson? When the Philistines had him uh, encompassed inside the city, they thought they had him trapped in there. And yet Samson prevailed. He took the gates, the iron bars of the gates of the city, ripped them off of the stone hinges, put them on his shoulders, walked up on top of a hill. I see that as uh, what Christ said. Uh, uh, I am uh, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And here's Samson with the gates, literally not prevailing against him. And he goes up on top of a hill. And I see that as Calvary. And he prevails over death and hell. What, but what was he inside the city doing? It picked him out a good looking prostitute. A whore. And was laying in there with her. In sin. When God did this great thing. What was Samson's spiritual condition when he destroyed 3,000 of the Philistines who were gathered in the temple of Dagon that day, when, after they gouged his eyes out, after they cut all of his hair off, his spiritual condition was he had given away his secret and he was paying the price for it. And, he, and it was because he loved those strange women. And yet his hair began to grow. God blessed him. He said, Lord, just one last time. And God gave him of his spirit so strong that he was able to bring the entire 
temple of Dagon down, killing 3,000 people that were up on the roof of that uh, thing. And, and uh, God killed more of his enemies in his death than he did in his life. And what I'm saying to you tonight is, when it says nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling, that is exactly, that. you know how you're going to make it to heaven with absolutely nothing in your hand to bring to Jesus Christ. Nothing. But he's going to save you anyway. Amen. Um, your Bible's open to John 17. And um, I'm going to... Um, I haven't uh, gotten into this as yet, but we're going to tonight. Um, and um, let's see, where is it? Come on. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Here we go. Nope, it's past that. Right here. John 17, verse 11. Um, there could be something symbolic in that. 11 is a number for confusion. And I think there's something to that here. We're going we're gonna to study this out tonight. Um, before we go to prayer, I'm going to say something. And I put a little video out today. Um, and um, I, I tell you what, God's already, uh, God's already blessed. God is so good. Um, I haven't said a whole lot, but I've been I've been talking uh, since we came back from Kenya. That um, one of our ministries was in jeopardy, and that was the feeding ministry, and it was because um, there really wasn't. We weren't for some reason we were not getting uh, in the mail. Um, a lot of the donations for um, the feeding ministry uh, or for anything else for that matter. It just seemed for some reason uh, everything just kind of dropped off. Now, you know, in, in, in the years that we've been doing this since 2009, uh, I've seen, you know, the feast and the famine come along. Uh, we've had times when uh, God just poured money into this place and we did what we could with it. And um, and then times when uh, there wasn't a whole lot coming in. And, you know, by God's grace, we always had enough in reserve uh, to keep doing what we were doing, to keep paying our bills and to keep everything going. And... Um, Usually on Monday and, and Thursday, Rose would make a deposit. And um, I would come in and she usually gets here earlier than Lisa and I does. And so by the time I would get in here, she would have just about all of her paperwork done for that day. And uh, she would always tell me, you know, here, here's she give me a little piece of paper and here's how much has come in and so on. And um, I don't, I do not look at the checks. I don't see who donates. I don't, I don't care who donates. I never have. Um, I don't want to know that information because I don't want to feel like I give uh, special attention to those that give a lot uh, or little attention to those who may give very little or not at all. And I've had people treat me over the years that way, I've had people who apparently they gave um, an amount that they felt was sufficient to to uh, be able to take a large portion of my time. And and then in some cases, they wanted me to preach what they wanted me to preach. They would come up with some goofy ideas and some whatever, whatever nonsense. And they and they would try to use that money to get me to spread, help them spread that information. I don't like that. I never have. And uh, that was one of the things I told God years ago. God, don't ever, ever let me fall into that trap of people using money to get to me. But anyway, uh, I would hear, you know, Rose would let me know how much, you know, we were going to deposit that day or whatever. 
And I'd rejoice in that most of the time. It was pretty good, and you know we did a lot of good things. We get back from Kenya, and um, um, Rose is not telling me. Uh, sometimes she don't tell me at all what had come in, and it was because it was very, very low. And uh, I thought, well, you know, we've seen times like this before. It'll pass. And so I just let it go. But it just kept on going and going and going and going. And um, Monday, um, come in here and um, she told me the amount. And I'm just going, do what? And she showed it to me and I'm just going, Something ain't right. And then, you know, you start thinking, man, did I, did, have I, have I gotten off into false doctrine and people aren't supporting it anymore or, or what? You know, I mean, I just, it really was bugging me. And I spent a lot of time last several weeks, uh, praying about this situation. You know, it says, okay, God, if there's something about me that you're wanting to change, change it. Okay. Just change me. Beat the fire out of me. Do whatever you got to do. Kill me off. I don't care. But just, you know, do something because, you know, this is starting to get serious. And, um, you know, we, we scraped together uh, enough money to where we could feed a few people. This last time in Kenya, and I showed you the pictures of it. Um, I think um, uh, one of our guys was supposed to go out and, and do some more feeding uh, yesterday. And I should be getting pictures uh, in from that shortly. But it was getting to where we were running out of money quick. And I've never seen it that bad. And so Monday I was telling the girls that work here, you know, what was going on. And somebody just out of the blue said, it's somebody stealing our mail. Well, I hadn't thought about that. But as soon as they said it, I went, you know what? That kind of makes sense. And um, today, somebody sent me a, a, in a text message a news story from last month, June 22nd, where the United States Postal Service is is telling you, don't put checks in your mailbox. Don't put checks in the blue uh, city town mailboxes that you see because um, people have, have fabricated keys for those blue mailboxes and they're getting in them. And people are, are going around and they're stealing mail out of people's mailboxes. And I went, are you kidding me? Because sometimes we get donations in cash. And we don't, you know, we don't encourage that, but sometimes we do. And so um, all of a sudden now, I'm, I'm putting two and two together. And I'm going, you know, this could be what's going on. Well, you know, we had this work done on the sewer. We put, had to put a brand new pump in there, brand new uh, control panel there, and that was about twelve thousand dollars. So we had we had enough money for that, and, and Rose last week um, wrote a check and mailed it to the company that did the work. Now the company that did the work, it, it's not like they're from you know, Oregon or Washington State, someplace where, or Alaska. They're from the St. Louis area. Any check mailed from here to there should have gotten in there in about two days. Well, she called them today. They still have not gotten that check. And I went, somebody's stealing our mail. Somebody's stealing our mail. And uh, then when I, of course, when I saw that article, that kind of, that kind of did a double witness in me that somebody was stealing our mail. Now, I don't know who it is. I don't know if it's like, like this article said, if it's various people that 
are, are, have figured out ways of cashing some of these checks that they find in there or whatever, or finding cash in there or whatever. Um, I will say that we have enemies in the local area, people that don't like this church and they hate me a lot. And, uh, but I don't know if it's, I don't know who it is. But we started doing something different yesterday, and I won't say what it was, but it has instantly made a difference in the amount of mail that we have gotten and the amount of offerings in one day that we have received because of what we're doing differently. Uh, one of the things we're going to do permanently is we're going to move the mailbox from up there by the road and we're going to put it down here. We've already talked to the postmaster. They said we could do it. We're going to move it down here by the building. We're going to put a lock on it. And the post, the, whoever the mailman is will be able to put the mail in there, but nobody can get it out unless they got the key. And um, so anyway, I almost, I, I just... I've pretty much decided that that's what's been going on, that somebody has been stealing our mail and doing it for quite a while. And so anyway, uh, I praise the Lord if that's the case, uh, because just, just since we made just a few minor changes in how we get our mail, uh, it's made a significant difference already. So anyway, help us pray about that. Um, and you know what I want? My flesh wants to find these people, hang them up by their toenails, and uh, pour honey all over their body, and then dump ants all over them, and have ants just eat them and bite them and fire ants from Texas. How many of you ever been bit by a Texas fire ant? There ain't nothing like it in the world. Uh, but my spirit says, I hope they get saved. I hope they get saved. That's my spirit. All right, John chapter 17, let's read this. And we'll go to the Lord in prayer. John 17, 11, And I think the number 11 is significant here. Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Now I've been meaning to get to this and talk about it, but we're going to do it tonight. Keep through thine own name. And what is his own name? Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So we have, we have two people in this universe that are called Holy Father. One of them is the real Holy Father. And if this was uh, to tell the truth, and um, uh, Gary, what's his name, would say, would the real Holy Father please stand up? God would stand up. He's the real Holy Father. There is a counterfeit Holy Father. Okay? And he pretends to be the Holy Father. He has taken upon himself the name Holy Father, but he is a counterfeit. And all of those, I, and I'm just going to say it like this. The beast has written on him the names of blasphemy. And when you entitle yourself as Holy Father and you force everybody that follows you to refer to you as Holy Father, you yourself are condemned and you are condemning every one. Unless they repent, you are condemning every man, woman, and child for calling you Holy Father. It's only, like I said, it's only one time in the whole Bible 
That phrase, one time, that's it. But it belongs solely to God in heaven and not a man. Could I get you to agree with me on that one? Hey, could I get you to agree with me on that one? Amen. All right, thank you. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings tonight on your word. Teach us great and mighty things. Father, help us to see, Lord, that who our enemy is. And our enemy is a man who calls himself Holy Father. It's a man who insists that everybody call him Santa Padre, Holy Father. God, I pray, dear God, that one of these days you do away with that blasphemy. And you and you alone are worthy of the title, Holy Father. Bless it tonight. Bless your name. Bless your word even above your name. Thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And you know, something I'm thinking of while I'm praying this, is that there, there is a verse in the scripture, in the book of Psalms, that says, Thy word hast thou magnified above all thy name. And a man who will take to himself God's name and blaspheme that name by referring to himself as Holy Father and those who, those who worship him as Holy Father, that man will also think nothing of altering, destroying, um, making insignificant, making it void, making it of none effect, the word of God, which God himself has magnified even above the name Holy Father. In other words, if he can commit enough blasphemy to call himself Holy Father, he can and does place himself even above the word of God. And of course, um, this is the man I'm referring to. Now... Uh, I will say the, um, the last pope to wear what is referred to as uh, the, the triple crown. Let me get a uh, pen here. This triple crown here, that hasn't been worn by a pope um, since Pope Paul. Pope Paul wore it at his coronation. Uh, John Paul I did not wear it. John Paul II did not wear it. Uh, Pope Benedict did not wear it. And Pope Francis did not wear it. But they still have their own version of what's referred to as the triple crown. Can anybody just take a guess as to why the Pope wears three crowns. Can anybody just take a guess at what you think that means? Yes. What, was, what did you say? Yeah, because Christ and in Christ dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Catholics believe that the Pope is the vicar of Christ or the replacement of Christ on this earth and that the Pope has the power, the ability, the authority that Jesus Christ himself bears. And so he wears a triple tiara, a triple crown uh, upon his head to show that he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and apparently who loves to wear a lot of lace. I just don't get into that. But anyway, let me read some things to you from various Catholic sources. I, I really tried to get it nailed down as to what, uh, what dogma, what pope it was, uh, what uh, what council decided this and, and I really couldn't find anything 
Uh, from what I can find, it goes back somewhere around the 9th century A.D. They started referring to uh, the Pope as, let's see here, who's this? Okay, um, anyway, the, the, the Pope started wearing um, or, or referring to himself as uh, Santa Padre, which is uh, the Holy Father. This says the precedent for calling spiritual fathers father can be seen in one of St. Paul's letters where he refers to Onesimus, a converted slave. Uh, this would be in the book of what? Philemon. Very good. Um, it's interesting that Catholics really don't want to tell you where something is in the Bible because they don't want you reading it. But anyway, Onesimus, a converted slave, as, quote, his own true son whom he begot. St. Paul is referring to his being a spiritual father to Onesimus, and this is very similar to our tradition of calling priests father. Now, let me stop right here for a minute. What is the, the problem here of referring to a priest with the title of father. What's the problem with that? Do what? Amen to that. You almost said it word for word. Uh, let's see here. No man. Okay. No man. No man. No man. No man. I'm trying to find that phrase. No man. Yeah. Verse Matthew 23, 9. And call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. So you have the, um, you have the, the stupid, stinking Catholic church. Telling everybody to call these men with their backward collars and their slinging incense and their uh, filthy things that they do with boys and girls and women and whoever. All those things they do, they, they are told to refer to them as father. But, and, and, and Paul even, even re referred to Timothy as his spiritual son. In other words, Paul, we, we don't have any, we don't have anything in the Bible about Timothy's father. We know that his mother and his grandmother were both believers. They were really the ones probably responsible for Timothy being a, a, a young Christian man and finally being the, the bishop of the church that they were at. But you don't hear anything about uh, Timothy's birth father. What you have is Paul, who is ministering to young Timothy. He's ministering to uh, uh, Eunice and Lois, who are the mother and grandmother of Timothy. Uh, but we don't hear anything about the dad. And Paul then is sort of raising young Timothy up as sort of a spiritual father to a spiritual son. But at no time did Paul ever tell Timothy, when you refer to me, Timothy, you must call me Father Paul. And when people, when you become bishop of this church, let no man despise thy youth, and they must call you Father Timothy. You don't see anything like that in the Bible. You don't see it when anybody was ordained a bishop, you don't see in any of the letters that Paul wrote, Peter wrote, John wrote, James, Jude. You don't see it in the four Gospels. You don't see it in the book of Acts as they formed the New Testament church. You see nobody calling nobody Father. Father Paul, Father Peter, Father this, Father that, or Pope. What does the word Pope mean? Anybody know? Pope. So, 
rope. Haven't you ever seen Pope soap on a rope? That's, a, that's actually a real thing. They were making them of uh, John Paul II. Everywhere he'd go, people would be, they had these molds and they made their own soap and it was Pope John Paul and they'd put a rope on it and when it was the Pope soap on a rope. And people had made a lot of money off these things, okay? Anyway, no, Pope, huh? So you can hang them. That's exactly right, okay? Uh, <laughs> boy, where my mind just went, you don't want to know, okay? But anyway, you're right. Pope is from the term Papa, okay? So already... In fact, that's what they call him in Italy. He is il papa, the papa, the pope. And in other languages, you hear it come out. They don't call him pope. They call him papa or papa or whatever. Um, but you don't see any of that in the Bible. You see Christ specifically telling everybody and establishing a rule called no man your father on this earth for one is your father which is in heaven. So he immediately wiped away any possibility that anybody, number one, should be called Pope or Papa or Father or Padre. So he said, uh, back to this, back to this uh, source, the converted slave as his true, own true son whom he begot. St. Paul is referring to as being a spiritual father to Onesimus. And this is very similar to our tradition of calling priests Father. The Pope then becomes the Holy Father. And I, I hate to even read those words because they are blasphemy. You see how, do you see how Catholicism twists things around to get around scriptures in this Writing here is no mention of Jesus saying, call no man your father on this earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. There's no mention of that here. All there is, is, well, um, you know, Paul referred to Onesimus as his spiritual son. So therefore, it would seem likely that Onesimus would refer to Paul as Father Paul, and that matches our tradition of calling priests fathers. Therefore, you see what they've done? They've gone from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing. And now this other thing is proof now that we must call the Pope Holy Father in his role as spiritual father of the entire, this is, all oh, this is blasphemy. I don't want to even say it. The, the spiritual father of the entire church on earth. Excuse me. Who wrought all people who are in the church of God? Who conceived every born again Christian? Who did that? Was it the Pope? It was God. We are the children, not of the Pope. We're the children of God. So the Pope then becomes the Holy Father in his role as spiritual father of the entire church on earth, cherishing the people and correcting us when necessary. Now see, there's just lots of things wrong with this. The spiritual father of the entire church on earth. The po now, what this means is, if you do not refer to the Pope as your father or your holy father or even il papa, santa padre, if you don't believe that the Pope is your father, you're not part of the church. Thus, you are doomed to hell. 
because you do not believe this doctrine that the Pope is your father, that he birthed you, conceived you, brought you into the church by his powers on this earth. If you don't believe that, then according to the Catholic Church, you cannot go to heaven. And we believe the exact opposite of that. The Pope had nothing to do with my salvation. When I was nine years old, I was not praying to St. Patrick. I was not praying to St. Mary. I was not praying to... Uh, <laughs> I tease my mom. I was not praying to St. Judy. I was not praying to anybody except Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. So there is Santa Padre, the vicar of Christ, the Holy Father. And he's called that generally without fail by most all Catholics. They don't say, now Pope Francis, because uh, Francis is the current Pope, they usually don't say in conversation, uh, uh, Pope Francis this, Pope Francis that. They usually say, well, the Holy Father said this last week. The Holy Father said this. Uh, in a speech last week, or the Holy Father. Did you hear that the Holy Father's coming to our area next? That's what they call him. Uh, by habit, they call him Holy Father or Santa Padre or whatever it is in their language. Uh, hear about this one. The threefold confession of Peter is meant to counteract his earlier threefold denial. The First Vatican Council cited these verses in defining that Jesus, after his resurrection, gave Peter the jurisdiction of supreme shepherd and ruler over the whole flock. When did he do that? He didn't. This is the very reason why we call the Pope Holy Father. Because he was set apart to be the visible head of the church on earth. Excuse me. We had, turn to Romans chapter 1. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Do you know that God is invisible to us? And we don't have a visible God on this earth. We do, however, have visible proof that there is a God and that he created the entire earth. But we don't have a visible God on this earth. In Romans chapter 1. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him, God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, to birds, to the four-footed beast, and to creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them uh, up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So while this phrase here says that this is the very reason why we call the Pope Holy Father, because he was set apart to be the visible head of the church on the earth, the Bible itself tells you that God is invisible. 
and remains invisible to us as long as we are here on this earth. And yet, there are things that represent the invisible, the invisible God, things that we can see, like his creation, his eternal power and Godhead, so that everybody is without excuse. When I go out at night and I see the stars in the sky, I don't believe that a big bang erupted and put all of those stars in place. I believe that God did that, don't you? Okay, when I see springtime come and things come to life all over again, I don't believe that evolution caused that. I believe that God causes that and he does it every year. Amen? That's the eternal, that's us being able to see God's eternal power in Godhead, even though God himself is invisible. So it says that he's the visible head of the church on the earth, a vicar of Christ whose authority and jurisdiction holds the entire church. It means that if you are part of the Roman Catholic Church, if the Pope gives you a rule and tells you that you must live by it, then you must live by it. I, um, I mentioned this the other day. I've, I found a, a book and I started uh, reading out of it yesterday when I was starting to do PMO. Uh, before I had to uh, shut everything off and uh, go take care of uh, the stomach ailment that I was going through at the time. But I had this little Catholic prayer book and it specifically said right on the page uh, to be read facing a crucifix. Now when Catholics tell you that they don't pray Paige, has, has any of your Catholic family members told you that they don't really pray to statues? Have they ever told you that? No? Have they told you that they don't really pray to statues? So, okay, they haven't told you that, right? Okay. Melissa, has your Catholic family members ever told you they don't pray to statues? They don't pray to idols? Boy, none of you guys are helping me tonight. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Come back next week, all right? Yes, Alicia! That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you prayed to their backside? <laughs> Right. Yes. What you got on your mind, Everett? That's probably who was stealing ours. Thank you for bringing that up, all right? Anyway, it took him a while. But anyway, they will try to tell you, oh, we don't really pray to the statue. But right there in that book, it said to be prayed facing a crucifix. And if you prayed that prayer under the right conditions, you got 
I can't remember how long it was. It seemed like it was a five-year plenary indulgement, which means that for five years you were forgiven of every single sin. For five years. No wonder there's 1.4 billion Roman Catholics in this world. They get a sin all they want to. Okay. Anyway, let me keep reading this. So we got a. The Lord made Saint Peter the visible foundation of his of this church. He entrusted the keys of the church to him. The bishop of the Church of Rome, successor to Saint Peter, is head of the College of Bishops, the vicar of Christ, and pastor of the Universal Church on Earth. And it tells you where you can find those. Some might question why we call the Pope the Holy Father. Catholic Answers tackles this question. Only God is holy. Okay, so let's stop right there. If only God is holy, then you are contradicting yourself by calling a man holy. By the way, I am holy. Now that wasn't the flesh me that said that. That was the new man in me that said that the new man the inner man sinneth not and cannot sin because god is his father uh, only god is holy by his very essence however by a person place or things association with god it too can be called holy to be called holy is to express the idea of consecration that someone or something. Now, why would they say something belongs to God? Because all throughout Catholicism, you have the dead bones of saints that they pray to. You have the... Um, you have the uh, Shroud of Turin that they believe is the holy shroud that covered Jesus. And they pray to it. And they say that it is a holy relic. You'll have the bone of, of the finger bone of some nun from a thousand years ago that had some sort of visitation by Mary. And they will pray to that little finger bone of that saint yes do what it is necromancy and they don't care how to how to get around it they're going to do it anyway david remember they're the ones and i i i i rediscovered my copy of uh, malachi martin's windswept house the catholic church is the group that in 1963 held at St. Paul's Cathedral where they, you know, where they nominate a pope and it's got, you know, God touching Adam's, you know, finger to make him alive, which is not how it happened and all that. It's got Michelangelo's artwork in it. And they did it in conjunction with a Catholic church in Charleston, South Carolina. And when I heard Charleston, South Carolina, I immediately knew why they chose Charleston, South Carolina. It was a Catholic church down there. It's on the 33rd parallel. Okay. So anyway, by phone, 1963, they conduct this ceremony called the enthronement ceremony of the fallen angel Lucifer. Okay. And Malachi Martin, a, who was a Jesuit priest at the time was fully aware of that ceremony taking place and he knew what it meant okay so these are the people who practice necromancy but they don't care they'll come up with some reason why that's a holy relic and we're going to pray to it because it still has the power of saint teresa of xerox or whatever you know it still has her power in it and if we pray then god will give us great graces as a result of that but anyway 
Only God is holy by his very essence. However, by a person, place, or things association with God, it too can be called holy. To be called holy is to express the idea of consecration that someone or something belongs to God. That is why the Bible can call many persons, places, and things holy. Excuse me. The only way that we can be holy is to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And to believe the word that he left us here on this earth. That's it. Amen. Amen. Um, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You know, that's what they're doing. They've taken the name of the Lord, Holy Father, and they have placed that upon the Pope. They've taken that name in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Isaiah 14, for thou said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So when you have the Pope taking on the name of Vicar of Christ, Christ on the earth, being the replacement for the Word of God, being the replacement for the Holy Spirit of God, and then taking on the name Holy Father, then you have the Pope fulfilling in part the prophecy of Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Somebody say amen. Mm. I'm going to stop right there. Except for this one more verse, Roy. You ruined it. Now, therefore, what have I there here? Saith the Lord that my people is taken away for naught. They that rule, listen, they that rule over them, the priests, the bishops, the cardinals, them that, uh, they that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and by my name continually every day is blasphemed. When they call that Eucharist the body and flesh of Jesus Christ, that's blasphemy. When they call that Pope Holy Father, that is blasphemy. When that priest is called Father, that's blasphemy. I wonder if the, if the hierarchy of the Catholic Church still sees the priest as being everybody's spiritual father while he's molesting a nine-year-old boy. That just... Disgust me. How can they call him father? Holy man of God. While he does this despicable act. Makes me angry.